All right, it's 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started with our final session in our Grazing Cover Crops webinar series. And today's session is going to be focused on some um, more of our traditional forage crops. The, this webinar series is sponsored by the North Central Region um, Sustainable Agriculture and Research Education and grant through them. Just a few reminders before we get started, please keep your mics and cameras off to help improve keep the quality or ensure the quality of our streaming um, by reducing our bandwidth that way. If you do miss any part of today's recording or, have, or you missed any of the other webinars, they are all recorded and are available on our NDSU Extension Livestock website under the Grazing Management tab. Again, thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions um, or comments, please put those in the chat box. And we're gonna get started um, with our first speaker. Megan Van Emmen, and she's going to be talking about grazing alfalfa, winter grazing, and alfalfa production. Okay, helps if you unmute. Can everybody see the slides? Yes, yes. there that looks good. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, not use Zoom for a actual meeting before. So um, <clears throat> as Miranda said, I'm gonna speak on our impacts of winter grazing on alfalfa production. Um, I would like to add just a little caveat in here. Um, this was a project from Dr. Emily Message and um, I took over for her, um, a lot of her grad students and some of her projects when she left Montana. Um, to move back to Pennsylvania. So um, just adding that in there, I'm not the actual PI. I guess I am the actual PI, but um, I was kind of on the periphery as this project was finishing up. So hopefully I can answer your questions um, as best as possible. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get going here. Maybe, maybe. Okay, there we go. Um, so, especially here in the Northern Plains, as well as even some um, other parts of the country, uh, fall and winter grazing alfalfa is pretty common practice. However, um, there's limited research available on how that's actually Im impacting the subsequent year's uh, alfalfa production. Um, there has been a few studies. One of them um, actually just grazed alfalfa and then provided an additional supplement while uh, those cattle were grazing alfalfa. Um, so the impacts of if alfalfa was actually doing any sort of impact on production um, was pretty minimal. It was, it, that was just kind of a secondary measure in, in that study. And then um, Dr. Message also uh, grazed alfalfa during the winter of 2017 and 2018, as I'm sure um, a lot of our North Dakota folks remember, as well as here in Montana. Um, that was the winter that never seemed to quit as well as the winter that was just awful in general with snow and temperatures. Um, but that uh, grazing did actually have a positive impact on alfalfa production. She hasn't published that work yet, um, but we did see those positive impacts um, with actual grazing um, as well as with our uh, cattle growth. So with that, there were two objectives with this study. One was to evaluate the impacts of winter grazing and feeding on alfalfa production and persistence. And then the secondary objective was to basically disseminate this information um, to our producers here in Montana and alfalfa growers uh, and the surrounding region at some of our field days uh, this summer. So um, how these fields were chosen, um, they had to be at least a two-year-old stand of alfalfa with greater than 90% alfalfa uh, still in the field. Uh, they had four exclosures uh, during the grazing period, and then that was paired with non, uh, or excuse me, that was paired with grazing um, plots. So measurements were taken in both April and June of 2019. In April, uh, the soil penetrometer, plant height, stem and plant density, and root scores were all collected. And then in June, um, plant biomass and plant height were collected right before the first harvest. So this was done in two counties. So um, 
one in the very far southwestern part of Montana in Beaverhead County. Um, this was an irrigated pasture, or excuse me, irrigated field, um, and they grazed 81 head. Those cattle weighed roughly 1,100 pounds, and they grazed them from November to January, um, so more of a stalker-based operation on that irrigated alfalfa. And the second being um, here in Custer County, where I'm located in Miles City, and that's a dry land operation, and 142 head were grazed. And those were uh, freshly weaned calves, weighing about 600 pounds, and they grazed from November to February. Um, we did have a producer here in Custer County. Um, however, we had to eliminate his uh, alfalfa pasture because he terminated his alfalfa stand um, without actually alerting us. So um, we were down to just that one field here in Custer County. Um, so just to give you an idea of what those plots looked like, um, the, I think everybody can see the mouse here. So, um, so here in Custer County, we have our field, which um, obviously with my lovely um, artistic skills here is pretty, pretty simple rectangle. But we had our um, four exclosures in that field, and then those were paired out in the grazing area with, with those paired grazing plots. And similar in our Beaverhead County, um, our four exclosures with another four paired grazing plots. So moving right into results, I know um, moving pretty quick here, but just to give you an idea, we just have our um, analysis completed through SAS. We had to run each location separately due to the differences between irrigated and uh, non-irrigated fields. Um, so up at the top, we have our grazed versus ungrazed and our p-values. On the left, we have our uh, measurements, so April and then June. And then here I have the metric um, measurements in uh, plants per meter squared. And then I converted everything to English units. So this is plant or stems per uh, foot squared. Uh, mouse keeps disappearing here. And then height in centimeters and inches, um, the penetrometer data, and then the root score data. So. Um, as we can see from each location, there weren't any significant differences in April based on our winter grazing uh, periods. So that's actually a very good sign is showing that we aren't having any negative impacts by grazing cattle on alfalfa uh, fields during the winter months. During those times when those, you know, especially those calves are um, rapidly growing and they need that extra nutrition, that alpha can be there to uh, provide an additional protein and energy source um, during those uh, cold, cold months. And then um, in June here, we have our height production. Um, we didn't have any data from the height production for our Beaverhead County uh, location, but we did have height data for our Custer County data, or for our Custer County location, excuse me, um, basically showing there was a slight tendency for the ungrazed plots to um, have grown to a greater height than our grazed. However, this was only about an inch difference, so um, not sure that that's actually showing a good uh, biological significance where we would actually see a negative um, impact on production. And that is shown, although not statistically different, um, we do see some numerical differences here between the actual production um, weight. And noting that our grazed plots were numerically greater than our ungrazed plots. So even though we don't have, um, even though there isn't a, a large difference in height, we did see a, pr a numerical production difference. Um, if we look over at our beaver head, similar here, you know, not statistically different, but we are seeing a slight difference numerically in those ungrazed versus grazed plots in the beaver head location as well. So overall, just noting that there aren't, or we didn't observe any negative impacts on production of alfalfa for that subsequent year after grazing. So 
this I think can give our producers a little bit more um, confidence when they're grazing their alfalfa to um, allow those animals out there to graze instead of holding them off and, and trying to feed a harvested forage during some of these uh, winter months. Oop, forgot I put a box in there. I apologize to put draw your attention to that, that slight tendency um, between that height. So as the data has shown, um, there weren't any significant differences uh, between the April uh, data in either location, um, which I know we all, um, as scientists, sometimes we're, you know, no differences. But I think in this instance, it's actually a good thing. You know, we're showing that there weren't any negative impacts of grazing on our uh, alfalfa pr production fields. And so we don't have to worry about any negative impacts on, on, uh, on that production while we're baling. And so we're not going to see those differences in bale weights or the number of bales coming off of those fields. Plus, it allows those calves to be on a high quality diet during those winter months um, and maybe we aren't feeding as much as that harvested forage um, while they're out grazing the alfalfa so we can save on some economic costs there for those livestock producers turning in onto those alfalfa stands. Um, so there's that. We're, we're working on hopefully getting this into our uh, Ag economics department to get some economic analysis completed on this as well. And, you know, for our second objective, um, we're, we were hoping to share our results this year at our field days at our research centers here in Montana, as well as then putting out an extension bulletin. Um, I put a question mark between the, the uh, by the field days because, well, as we are all aware, um, those decisions haven't been made on if those are actually going to continue this summer um, based on COVID-19. So we're unsure of that, but we are going to um, get this published in an extension bulletin to get this information available to our, our both our livestock producers and our alfalfa growers. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to thank the U.S. Alfalfa Farmer Research Initiative as a part of the National Alfalfa and Forage Alliance, uh, the Midwest Forage Association, um, USDA ARS4 Keo, which is where our Custer County uh, field was, and then Pathhausen's uh, producers in Dillon, Montana, at our Beaverhead County location. And then um, two grad students, Kylie Guardhouse and Tristan Benson, and then one of our undergraduate workers for collecting all of these samples uh, for analysis last April and June. And then um, Jess Murray is our Beaver Beaverhead County agent who helped us find that location. And then Mike Schultz who aided us in, in providing us with, a, with the uh, producer location here in Custer County, even though that didn't work out, but identifying those producers that were willing to be a part of this project. So I know that was fairly quick, um, but not a lot of significant results there um, statistically. So with that, I will open it up to any questions. Yeah, we'll take a couple questions now, and then if we have any additional ones, we'll wait till the end, until the end. There is one question um, from Lucinda, who has an old alfalfa field that she plans to terminate and plant to Milo. Uh, it got alfalfa weevils and doesn't want to spend, and she doesn't want to spend thousands to spray them. Um, can she <laughs> graze to set it back to alfalfa and then either spray to terminate or V plow? So that's a good question and I'm just going to add that I'm not the forage, I'm not a forage expert or specialist, um, so I'll do my best. So you can graze to help um, with that alfalfa weevil um, infestation. However, when we typically see weevils, um, we're not turning in, you know, our cattle during, during that time frame. Um, so harvesting can also help. Um, how best to terminate and replant into Milo. I'm gonna apologize, I'm not a forage specialist and I can't best answer that question. Um, so I would suggest contacting a forage specialist on that and I apologize uh, for, for ha not having that knowledge. Um, Marisol, is that something you could jump in and answer? No, you're muted, Marisol. There. 
There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, Lucinda, um, I think with the weevils, we always recommend the harvest and, or in this case, graze. Um, if you, so you would want to do that grazing before you plant the milo. I don't see there would be a problem. It's not something I do either because we don't grow milo here. But um, it should work. I don't see why it shouldn't work. And yeah, I would, I would, you know, you should save, you should save the, the don't apply any insecticides because it's costly. And also you're going to have a time that you cannot graze or cannot use the forage, you know, as a, uh, harvest interval of the application depends what insecticides you use. So I think a big idea to stay away from the insecticides and graze alfalfa before you uh, terminate it and don't spend the money on, weevil, on, on, on insecticide this year. That's all I know, but I, I don't know much about, you know, the rotation. <laughs> so that's all I can help with. Thank you, Marisol. Um, do we have time for one more question for Megan, if anyone has one? Okay, well, if you think of something else, just type it in the chat box and or email it to me and we'll make sure it gets addressed at the end. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our next speaker, Kylie Guardhouse, and she's gonna be talking about sampling quality, yield, and condensed tannin content. Okay, can you see my screen? I'm good. Yes, you look good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Like she said, I'm Kylie Gardhouse. I'm a, a master's student at Montana State University. I'm working under Megan Vinneman. Um, and today I'm talking about the effects of sandfoin uh, variety and harvest uh, maturity on quality, yield, and condensed in and content. So a little bit of uh, just an outline. I'm going to go over some background. Um, our materials and methods, and then our uh, results and discussion. So sandfoin is a high quality perennial forage um, comparable to um, the nutrient value of alfalfa. It's also highly palatable. It's been shown to have anthelmintic properties, um, meaning that it could be used for a dewormer. Um, it has no autotoxicity effects, so, um, kind of like alfalfa does. You can't keep planting that. So that could be a positive with um, this variety. Um, it's non-bloating. Research has shown that um, it can decrease um, bloat by 93% with feeding 20% alfalfa in a mix without, uh, sorry, excuse me, a 20% sandfoin um, in a mix with alfalfa. Um, and this is because it has a high condensed tannin content and these con condensed tannins bind to protein, um, causing them to be less soluble, which um, decreases the production of foam within the rumen. So materials and methods, we had three locations, uh, Moccasin and Bozeman in Montana, and then Logan, Utah. Um, we had a split plot design and we had four different varieties of sandfoin, our AAC Mountain View, Esky, Shoshone, Delaney, and then we had a Shaw um, alfalfa for a check. So we did our sampling at 10%, 50%, and 100% bloom for um, each of our varieties. So this is just a layout of what um, our design looked like. So we had um, each row consisted of our five different types of um, varieties. And then we were um, sampling at again, 10, 50 and 100% bloom. And then this was replicated four times at each location. So spring 2018, soil samples were taken, fertilizer and herbicides were applied. And then we seeded at a rate of 74 pounds of um, pure live seed per hectare uh, for sandfoin, and then 30 pounds for alfalfa. In spring 2019, soil samples were collected again and fertilizer was applied. And then summer of 2019, we did our yield and quality samples. Um, these, were these were done by taking 
two one meter squares in each of our plots and clipping to five centimeters in height. And then from that, we took our subsamples. They were um, dried and ground and then sent out for analysis. Quality samples, we were looking at ADF, NDF, and crude protein. And those samples were sent to Harley Newman um, at University of Missouri. And then we also were looking at our condensed tannin content. And those were sent to Jennifer McAdams at, the, uh, at Utah State University. We used a, a general linear model, and then we were analyzing for treatment and variety, and we analyzed within just each location due to some differences that we had um, at each location. So for our results, we, um, there were no significant uh, differences in treatment or variety or in interaction at Utah for production. In Bozeman, we saw a treatment variety effect um, where Esky and Delaney were performing the best for our um, sandpoint varieties, we did see higher production in our alfalfa. Um, at Moccasin, we saw a treatment and a variety significance. Um, at this location, Esky and Shoshone were performing best for our sandpoints. And then again, Shaw was performing um, highest uh, overall. At our con for our condensed tannins, we saw at um, Utah that we, there was a treatment and a variety um, significance. All the um, sandpoint varieties were similar and they decreased with maturity, which is typical for um, what other research has shown. In Bozeman, we also saw a treatment and a variety significance. Um, again, a decrease with increasing maturity and then our AAC variety of sandpoint had the highest levels of condensed tannins. Moccasin, we saw treatment and variety interaction. Um, similar levels of condensed tannin across all sandpoint varieties um, and a decrease uh, with maturity again. So for our ADF content in uh, Utah, we saw a, a, a treatment um, effect for Bozeman and Moccasin, we both saw um, a treatment and variety interaction. NDF, similarly to our ADF, we saw that there was a, a treatment effect at Utah. And for Bozeman and Moccasin, there was a treatment variety interaction. Uh, crude protein content at Utah, we saw a treatment and a variety effect. And then for Bozeman, we saw just a treatment effect. Um, and then for Moccasin, we saw a treatment and variety um, significance. So a little summary, um, Shaw was more productive than Sanfoin, which is typical for what we've seen in past research. But this could also be due to differences across locations, um, environmental differences and wildlife factors. We ran into a few problems at um, at our Bozeman location, we could not keep the deer out of the sand point. Like we said, it's highly palatable. And then we also ran into um, alfalfa weevil, which could have influenced our um, Shaw production. Shaw had lower condensed uh, tannins, which is also something that we've seen in past research. Um, it has really low con contents, while uh, sand point has much higher content. We saw an increase in ADF and NDF with increasing maturity a decrease in crude protein with increasing maturity. And then one of our last objectives that we are um, looking into is the economic impacts, which we are still waiting on uh, those results for. With that, I'll open it for questions. Well, do we have any questions for Kylie? If you could please put them in and I'll open it up for question, other additional questions for Megan as well. Um, and we did have one while folks are thinking about questions for Kylie, um, that Lucinda had a follow-up regarding alfalfa termination and if V plowing would terminate alfalfa. And so I don't, Megan or Marisol, if you wanna, if you can jump in and answer that. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Is your alfalfa that you have there is a Roundup ready? I, I would need to know that because usually, you, you know, you should be able to kill it, but the problem is you have a big plow, you, some plants are going to stay there, you won't be able to kill them all. So usually to terminate alfalfa, we use 2,4-D herbicide and then plow it if you want, but you almost need that. And if it's Roundup ready alfalfa, uh, you, you need that. If it's not Roundup ready, you can use uh, glyphosate to try to kill it. But alfalfa is still pretty resistant to glyphosate, so we, we usually terminate it with 2,4-D and then, uh, then, then we plow it in if we need to. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you, Marisol. Um, so I just launched a poll just to kind of we want to, we have a few questions to see how effective this this platform is for for teaching and learning and extension. Um, so if you could answer those questions for us, and it helps us decide if this is something we need to is this a platform we need to use moving forward or if we need to adjust things. More and then also if you have any other additional comments or tech if you had technology issues you could type that in the chat box that would be appreciated. Yeah, and uh, the question is about cover crops irregulations. Oh shoot! I'm sorry, I launched the wrong poll. Oh, sorry. I will get the right one this time. <laughs> Here we go. This might make a little more sense. Okay. <laughs> Um, so there is a question for Kylie. The condensed tannins in sandfoin have been shown to reduce entric methane in cattle. Is sandfoin a one-to-one -one substitution for alfalfa in, in the ration? Um, how cost competitive is it? And do other legumes used for cow feed have similar um, entric reduction properties? So there's a few different parts to that. You know, I don't know much about um... The reduction of that methane in cattle. I don't. I don't know if Megan knows anything about that. Um, I think the substitution would be pretty similar because it's similar um, nutrition nutrient value. Um, but I don't know about that about the methane properties. I don't know if Megan knows anything about that either. Um, I haven't looked into that specifically. Um, I have read some of that information. Um, Sam, I'm trying to read through. Yeah, and I would agree with Kylie. It, it probably would be about a one-to-one -one substitution for alfalfa just based on, you know, crude protein and energy um, of the sandfoin as long as it's harvested um, in, a, in an optimum time frame. Um, I don't know of any other legumes that would reduce the enteric methane production similar to um, uh, sandfoin. Um, lupines, uh, as an example, I, uh, I'm a little worried about lupines um, just due to some of its negative impacts it could possibly have um, on cattle. Uh, but I will, yeah, you just sent a link um, from Utah State here. So yeah, I'll definitely check that out and, and thank you. Do you have any additional questions? Um, and again, I've just launched our, we, I launched our second poll and this is the correct one. <laughs> Just a few reminders um, that if you if you are a um, certified crop consultant, you can self-report, and I will be sending out um, the agendas for these webinars, as as well as a link to where to find the recordings to all of our participants. As I had mentioned, that all of these are recorded and are available on our NDSU Extension. Um, livestock cover crop page um, and the link is on is up for you there if you want if you want that it's also I've also put it in the chat box a couple times as 
And we just want to thank everybody for being flexible with us as we change to this format and for the folks that did suggest that we try doing this as a webinar since we were unable to do it in person. Workshop. Thank you.